2023, 2023-2024 um, academic year. Uh, Laura Mann was a home birth nurse midwife who served patients with compassion and love. She was a visionary uh, who created the first integrative health center uh, in the state of Vermont after her diagnosis of stage four breast cancer. Um, we honor her legacy um, through the Endowed Laura Mann Lecture Series. Um, each year, three distinguished uh, integrative healthcare leaders are invited to share best practices, uh, the latest research and innovations in the field. Um, and today we're very excited to have Dr. Ben Kligler with us. Um, ben has been a trusted colleague over many years. He was um, involved in commenting on um, our initial plans for the comprehensive health, uh, pain program. Um, he is director of the Office of Patient-Centered Care and Culture Transformation uh, at the Veterans Administration. Um, in that role, he is charged with advancing a whole health care model um, for the Veteran Administration, 6.2 million patients. I think that's right, Ben. Um, so a phenomenally large job. Um, in February 2023, February of this year, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine released a report uh, recommending that the Department of Health and Human Services and the Veterans Administration um, should work to scale up the whole health initiative, which Ben has been integral in creating at the Veterans Administration. Um, ben is a board certified family physician. Uh, he's former chair of uh, the Academic Consortium for Integrative Health and has been active in this uh, work over uh, more than two decades. So Ben, we're delighted you're here um, and I will let you take the, the mic. Great. Thank you, John. Um, and thank you for having me. Appreciate it. You guys hearing me okay? Yeah, great. Um, yes, great to be here. And um, I'm going to just share a bit about what we're doing and uh, hopefully leave some time for questions at the end. Before I do, I just want to say uh, I hope all of I know that, well, I hope Kara and John know, but I hope all of you know um, how important the work you guys are doing at UVM is for this effort around the country to make care more whole person oriented. You know, I, I get the opportunity to talk in a lot of venues around the country sometimes more than I want. And um, the fact that you guys are modeling this uh, kind of approach, value-based in some ways, approach to whole person care in real life with a, you know, a, a challenged population uh, in a state that is not super wealthy and that it's working um, is not uh, is something that people around the country are really interested in and and uh, and following. So I hope you guys know that. Um, no pressure, but it's a great model that you guys are building there. Um, so I have as my first slide. I like to have these ripples here because of this idea that um, you know the health system is a giant place. It, it's not a pond. It's an ocean. It's it's monumental and. Um, uh, we don't always know where our actions are going to go or or what our what kind of impact we're going to have. And so this idea that we do what we do and then the ripples spread out, we don't necessarily know where they end up. But in the end, those kind of ripples are what ends up reshaping a shore or a landscape, um, et cetera. So I just think it's important to keep that in mind. And um, since we're in Vermont, I felt obliged to give a more apt metaphor for kind of patience and, uh, and the impact of, of uh, the natural things that flow. So uh, this is uh, our, our, our maple syrup operation. I live part time in Guilford and um, you just got to hang those buckets up and you got to keep taking them in and you got to keep chopping the wood and, uh, and we're, we're getting to where we want to be. Um, I feel uh, um, n not planned, but I, I just want to take a second to acknowledge kind of the recent developments in the Middle East and um, the just the pain and suffering that's happening on all sides there. I, I happen to have family in Israel and um, maybe we could just take one second and send prayers non 
partisan prayers for for every side and and all the people are being uh harmed and 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 who are suffering so maybe just a second to do that and then i can proceed Great, thank you. I, I didn't feel like I could really focus without doing that. Um, and, you know, hopefully the same metaphor of we do what we do every day. And at some point, maybe all those ripples translate into change. Uh, hopefully that applies in the Middle East and elsewhere in the world, too. So so as John mentioned, the VA is a is a large system. Uh, it's uh, a, a 140 VA medical centers uh, closest to you guys is in White River. Uh, it's about a thousand plus outpatient facilities. There's one in Burlington um, and uh, 400,000 now staff and 6.2 million or so actively enroll, actively sort of uh, participating veterans. And then I think a total of 9 million plus enrolled in some fashion. So um, it's a big system and it's a great opportunity to kind of try to uh, elevate this approach, which is, you know, similar to what you all are doing in the model that Integrative Health is doing at UVM, but kind of elevate it to a, a system-wide level. So um, this is our definition of whole health. There are lots of definitions out there. Uh, this is the one that we've crafted really kind of specific to the VA. It, you know, it, people are going to, now that whole health has become kind of a, a bit of a buzzword, people are going to be defining it in a lot of different ways. But in the center of it is this idea of uh, moving beyond what's the matter with you as the focus of our work with people that you know are a very effective and 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 really uh, in some ways wonderful healthcare system which has been for the most part very disease oriented in the sense that even when we go to prevention we look at things like flu shots and you know prevention of specific diseases and we're really talking about widening the aperture going bigger thinking about the whole person in every setting and then beyond that even just thinking about putting the whole person really in the driver's seat of the care and i think the most important words in this definition are those two bolded words empowers and equips because that is really you know we like to use this phrase changing the conversation to describe what we're doing and that really is at the core of what we're doing because um, that has not been the primary function of our healthcare system to empower and equip. It's been uh, diagnose, treat, fix, uh, eradicate where we can. Um, and it just hasn't had a, kind of the primary focus on what's important to the person that is, is where we're really starting in VA. Uh, this, I'll spend a minute on this slide because this is kind of a, well, very dense, but also I think important to um, kind of get a big picture of. Uh, so the whole health system, which this is a diagram of, is the delivery model that we're putting forward for advancing whole health across uh, the across the country. Uh, it has three parts. The pathway, which is that green circle at the top, is actually uh, we call it a non-clinical component. So it doesn't involve doctors, nurses, pharmacists. Uh, it involves a, a fellow veteran generally, although it doesn't have to be a fellow veteran, but a, a fellow person, a peer, who uh, has been trained as a facilitator. And the idea of that circle is that that's a place where a veteran can have this conversation uh, that's been missing from conventional healthcare. What's important to you in your life right now? What matters to you? What is it that you uh, need to help get there? What's something you can change today to help get there? And so these conversations can happen with an individual facilitator. Many times they happen in a group. Uh, they can happen online. We have an app. Uh, they can happen with a health coach. Uh, they can even happen with a clinician if that clinician is ready to kind of just listen and, and really put the, the person at the center. So we think that's a really important kind of addition and innovation to how we're approaching people and their, and their health. Then there's the well-being programs you can see in the bottom left. That's where this idea of equipping, of building out the toolbox that people have available to uh, make change and kind of get to what matters to them. And those tools have a lot of different shapes. There might be a nutrition class. 
Uh, it might be a yoga or meditation class. It might be um, going to see a complementary medicine practitioner. Uh, so VA for about six years now, almost seven, has been covering eight evidence-based uh, complementary integrative health approaches. You can see them on the left. So these are all offered now as part of standard VA medical benefits. And uh, you know what's great about the VA is that it's both payer and provider of care. So when the system leadership decided it was time to expand the toolbox, <clears throat> we were able to do that. And um, we don't have the struggles with getting reimbursement for important services that, um, that some people some, in some places have. So um, this is making a huge difference. Uh, we don't have every service available in person at every VA, it's just too big a system. So if veterans can't get these things in person, they get sent out to a community provider or uh, a lot of times they can access them virtually as well. And then, and this is also a place, so, so health coaching is a really critical part of this whole health system, but health coaching really can live in any of these three circles. A health coach can work in the pathway, they can be embedded with other uh, well-being programs, or they can even work in whole health clinical care. So we have whole health coaches now working on primary care teams, on pain teams, et cetera. Uh, and I think it's really important to uh, understand and, and, and kind of value the central role that health coaches have because a health coach is really about understanding what's important to the person and then helping them plan and helping them keep themselves accountable for whatever changes they wanna make. And that's kind of in some ways the essence of what we're trying to do. So the third circle is whole health clinical care. This is in a lot of ways the most challenging because we're working with you know a couple of hundred thousand clinicians across the VA to really help them shift um, how they look at their job. So not in any way um, give up the disease oriented approach, the prevention oriented approach, but expand the aperture again and make sure that they uh, are aware of what's important to their patient and that they really factor that into their work with the patient. And so we're making a lot of progress. Um, thankfully, a lot of people went into healthcare because they like people, they want to know what's important to people. And so many of our clinicians in the VA are, are very motivated to have this conversation. As you can imagine, there are a lot of challenges, uh, busy practices, time, uh, incentives, you know, VA clinicians, uh, although it's not quite as bad as in the private sector, they have productivity expectations and RVUs. And so uh, they do feel a lot of pressure in terms of time. And, and so figuring out um, uh, efficient ways for people to, to incorporate that conversation into the visit with the patient is, is a lot of work that we're doing. Um, in addition to being this uh, idea of putting the person at the center and what's important to them at the center. Another thing that the whole health approach does is it kind of forces us in a way to address or, or incorporate or raise our awareness of some of the social and structural determinants. You know, if, if you have something that's important to you in your life, whether it's, you know, going back to school, being able to do a better job supporting your family, uh, but at the same time, you're experiencing gender discrimination or food insecurity or racism in your workplace that's keeping you from uh, advancing the way you want to. Um, these things are, we can't ignore these things when we're talking to you about what's important to you. So this whole health conversation is very naturally now expanding to include the conversation about uh, understanding what social determinants of health are, are impacting patients. and. In VA, we have a, a real blessing in that, um, not for all of them, I mean, certainly we don't have a, a great approach to address racism in some ways, but for things like housing and food insecurity, uh, VA has a lot of programs. VA has a huge number of social workers. I think we're the largest employer of social workers in the country, 17,000, I think is the number. So we have an infrastructure uh, that's aimed at being able to help address a lot of these things. So. Um, so this is a really natural evolution of how whole health is looked at in the VA. And I think it's really uh, fantastic. It's not the only avenue, obviously, through which people are addressing social determinants. I mean, there are many, um, but the idea that it's such a natural fit, I think, uh, is, is really great and helping us move forward. 
So let me shift and talk about kind of what's what does this look like in the VA? This is our Undersecretary of Health, Sharif El Mahal. Uh, he's the boss of the VHA, reports up to the secretary of the VA, who's at the cabinet level. Uh, he came in about a year and a half ago and identified what he thought were the priorities for the system. And you can see some of them are, are not surprising, uh, addressing veteran suicide, toxic exposures. But he also identified that uh, whole health and supporting the whole health approach across the system had really become a priority for veterans, for clinicians, and that it was something he really wanted to support. And this has been huge in terms of facilitating our ability to spread it across the system. Uh, this is also uh, something that the VA, the big department, has committed to, including the secretary. So this is the strategic plan for the VA. Now, you may think, oh, big deal, strategic plan. It's another, you know, uh, spiral bound notebook that lands on somebody's shelf and it's the government. But the thing about this is that um, what's in the strategic plan, if you're a government agency, is what you end up having to uh, report out to in terms of performance to Congress, to the president, to Office of Management and Budget. It's what's ultimately looked at uh, when they make new budgets. So how did you do in uh, making progress towards what you identified as strategic priorities. So it ends up being really important for a federal agency. Um, and so good news that whole health is explicitly called out as something that VA is committed to in strategic plan. Um, this is just a snapshot. I'm sorry, this graph, has, I have to get it updated for this last fiscal year. But this is just to give you a picture of the growth over the past a uh, few years, and what you can see is um, whole health is 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 growing and growing and growing. Now, oh my goodness, this is a really old graph. In oh no, sorry, I was hiding the last column. Um, you can see that we've really had an amazing jump in the last year. Uh, in FY twenty two, we go in fiscal years, uh, one million nine thousand veterans had some contact with whole health, and in uh, this year, and I have a new number as of the end of the year, end of September, we were up above 1.6 million veterans. Now, not all these people obviously are having a, a meaningful, enduring change in how they look at their health care. A lot of these people, oh, I took a yoga class. Oh, I had one conversation with somebody on my healthcare team. But they've really gone on to continue in the traditional kind of system. And there's nothing wrong with that. We, ne we do not in any way expect that every person using the system is going to want this approach. Some people are very comfortable with um, uh, sort of a more conventional relationship with their healthcare team. I show up, I get my prescriptions, I get my referrals, I go home, thank you very much. And of course, that's fine. And of course, the idea, the whole idea of whole health being about you is that the relationship that you want with your healthcare system and your healthcare team is, is the guiding principle. So I don't wanna give the impression that this means every veteran is, is doing some big whole health thing, but what it does mean is that uh, 26 or 7% of veterans have now had an explicit kind of invitation to join uh, some of the whole health services. And, and um, that's huge because scaling something in a system like the VA is very challenging all over the country, lots of different kind of cultures, lots of different uh, accents. I mean, we reach as far as Guam and the Virgin Islands. So, um, you know, the fact that we're getting this kind of traction nationally is really, uh, I think, very meaningful and impressive. And what it means ultimately is that veterans who are interested are going to hear about it and, and are gonna have the opportunity. Um, we've been tracking some of the impact of whole health, and I'm just going to share a couple of things. Uh, this is a, a group of veterans with chronic pain at the 18, what we call the whole health flagships, which was the first kind of set of VA medical centers to really fully deploy the whole health system. Uh, and these people were uh, veterans with chronic pain who happened to be on opioids. Uh, so this obviously is very relevant to the work that the Integrative Health Program is doing at UVM. Uh, tracked 114,000 people over the course of a year and compared veterans who were using whole health to veterans who weren't. 
So the black bar is veterans who weren't, and you can see they had an 11% decrease in their average dose of uh, opioids daily. And then as you go to the right and you look at veterans who were using whole health, the people in the two right-hand columns, which are um, uh, eight or more visits, they had on average a 38% decrease in their uh, daily opioid dose. Um, so over three times the difference in terms of the magnitude of the decrease. Now, obviously, we're not saying everyone has to get off opioids. I think, you know, we all feel that there was a little bit of a, a knee jerk uh, that went a little too far in that direction. And there are still some people who really need these. But obviously, people who need them should be on the lowest dose that's going to work for them. So even just reducing the dose at this level, uh, I think, is a great opportunity. Now, it does need to be said this is observational data. This is not randomized data. So what that means clearly is uh, the people who chose whole health, we saw what happened to them. We compared them to the people who didn't choose whole health. We did do some matching techniques, uh, something called propensity score matching to kind of try to even out the differences. Um, but you still have to acknowledge that people intrinsically who are choosing to grab the whole health opportunity may be different. And that may be why they were able to decrease their opioid use uh, so much more quickly. So, you know, a lot of the data we have in support of the whole health impact now, uh, it's very impressive, but you do need to keep in mind that it's observational. Um, and, and what that means is there's really, uh, you know, there's a source of bias, uh, selection bias that we, you know, we just have to keep in our minds. There's no way to really fully get rid of it with an observational trial. Um, so we have to just be aware. There are a good number of randomized trials happening in VA now of different aspects of the whole health approach, um, randomizing people to have a coach, for example, be embedded in their clinical team, as opposed to uh, have it just be a service that's in the overall system. Um, so we are gonna be learning more about the impact of specific parts of the whole health system, uh, but we can't really, uh, ethically at this stage, do a study that randomizes people to not have access to whole health. It just wouldn't be fair. We wouldn't get IRB approval. We wouldn't get the veterans approval. Um, so we do have to rely to a great degree on some observational data. That said, I'll also share a couple of, I think, important results that we've seen over the last year or two. The second bullet there has obviously been very uh, meaningful to uh, leadership in our system. Veterans with chronic low back pain who start using whole health, when you track them out 18 months later, they're 20 to 40% less likely to have needed uh, invasive spine procedures like epidurals, neurostimulators, uh, low back surgery. Um, it does, you know, attenuate over time. So it's more impressive at three months, but it sustains pretty well at 18 months. Uh, and obviously that's very important, not only in terms of possible cost avoidance, but avoidance of potential complications from invasive procedures and, and sort of the pain and suffering that comes with those things. So that's, that's great news. And we're continuing to look at uh, what other services can we potentially generate avoidance in uh, by helping people get more engaged with whole health. Um, this third bullet also really important. So, um, Veterans with a diagnosis of anxiety, depression, or PTSD who um, start using whole health, who, who aren't in a formal, uh, VA really relies on these things called evidence-based psychotherapies, which are kind of what you would call protocolized, um, finite time um, therapy approaches. So those are things like uh, uh, CB, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy for pain. Uh, you know, a 12 session protocol or uh, prolonged exposure therapy for PTSD. This is kind of really front and center in how VA handles some of the mental health diagnoses. And uh, so veterans who started using whole health uh, a year later, two and a half times more of those were likely to be engaged in a psychotherapy than veterans who didn't. So what this suggests is that something we're doing is helping people feel let's just say more empowered to go ahead and grab onto some of the evidence-based services. We are interested in looking at other things like uh, medication compliance, you know, other ways that uh, people need to engage with uh, healthcare. 
uh, and see what the impact of being involved with whole health is in, on those things. And so there's a lot of research ongoing, but you can see these are some of the other benefits that we've uh, seen with whole health. Uh, I think in some ways the most important is more engagement in healthcare and self-care because this leads to uh, m better outcomes in all kinds of diseases. And so we don't have to limit ourselves to saying we're gonna impact heart disease or we're gonna impact pain. We know that when you have more engagement, people have better outcomes across the board. So hopefully there's a lot more to come out um, in terms of outcomes and results over the course of the next couple of years. Um, just to show you how this is working, uh, we've really moved now from a stage where people looked at whole health as kind of like a separate thing that happens over there. Uh, and it's now being really uh, actively integrated into kind of the main clinical services in VA. So in mental health, this is the way they now describe their approach to care. They call it the step mental health continuum. And you can see kind of it goes from, okay, you have a mental health problem. Can you deal with it in your own family, in your life? Do you need help from your primary care? Do you need help from a specific mental health clinic? And all the way up to, do you need inpatient help? And what's great is they've now explicitly added this idea that whole health is fundamental to being able to approach mental health. And so what this means is before you even go very far along this, you have to have the opportunity to have a conversation about, you know, what is important to me in my life? Am I having any opportunity to engage with that? Am I participating in activities that are meaningful to me? And I think that's really powerful that this is how mental health is now defining their strategy. It takes it beyond just, oh, we're taking a clinical disease oriented approach. I mean, all this stuff happens before there's even a diagnosis. So I think this is a very powerful shift in how, uh, how some of the clinical services are looking at, um, at whole health. Um, oops, sorry, went too fast. This is just another example. This is the pain service. This is their step care model. So this is the national kind of approach to pain. And you can see when you look at their first two steps, which are similar to mental health, you know, what can you do for yourself in the community with your family? And then what can you do with your primary care team? You can see that the whole health approach and the complementary integrative health services are just integrated here, considered just part of what needs to happen along with you know, pharmacy management, uh, uh, occupational therapy, PT, you know, you can see things like battlefield acupuncture, whole health coaches. And one thing I love is here in the foundational level, uh, engagement and meaningful activities. So you're a person with chronic pain, before we even think about medication or procedures, have we had a conversation with you about what's important in your life? And are you getting connected with that? And uh, I just really love that this is now kind of the formal recommendation. Now, this doesn't mean that interventional pain docs across the VA are miraculously transformed uh, and, and having, you know, putting away their needle and, and not taking it out before they talk to the veteran about what's important. It, it, I just want to be clear, <laughs> you know, it doesn't mean that. Um, but again, it means that the chances that somebody's going to encounter an opportunity to explore this before they're pulled fully into kind of the um, more uh, high-tech and procedure-oriented medicine, uh, it, you know, it's just that, that much more likely now, which I think is great. So um, this is something we talk about a lot. You know, we're measuring um, encounters and how many unique veterans have uh, been touched by whole health somehow. And that's because our healthcare system is very oriented towards, you know, counting, counting things, counting encounters. Uh, and VA is not um, immune to that. Our, it's very important to our uh, leadership and it's important to Congress. You know, we need to be able to show that more and more veterans are using this to keep demonstrating how important it is that, that the system and the government and Congress that, that you know, we continue to be supported. But, then there's this other dimension, which is, you know, it's not just about counting the numbers. It's about trying to understand what difference we're having for individual people. And so you go back to like, what is the essence of what we're trying to do? And this slide really captures it to some degree. So this shows that, and some of you may have seen this before, people with a low sense of purpose in life 
uh, at age 50 in particular, uh, have two and a half times the risk of early mortality compared to people with a high purpose in life. This is not just about suicide or depression. This is about what would normally be considered medical outcomes as well, cardiovascular health, et cetera. So somehow having a sense of purpose in life leads to longer life. And you may think, well, that's intuitive, et cetera. But when you look at the magnitude of this two and a half times, you know, that's like, what is the impact of smoking three quarters of a pack a day? Or what's the impact of obesity? Or, you know, this is a huge impact in terms of risk. But ask yourselves the question, have you ever asked one of your patients, uh, how are you doing connecting with what's important to you in your life right now? Or what is giving your life meaning and purpose right now? We don't ask. And we don't ask because we haven't thought it was part of our job. And also we haven't known what we would do, I think, if we uh, get an answer that, no, I don't have much purpose at this point. Um, so we're ignoring this huge contributor to mortality and quality of life and morbidity uh, because we haven't known how to deal with it. And so a lot of what we're trying to do with whole health is create a system that actually can uh, begin to help address that, that, that risk factor. Um, so one of the things we're doing, which to me, I think is both one of the most important things and one of the most difficult things. And one of the things that I hope you guys maybe can do uh, in your, um, as you expand the program in, in Vermont, uh, we're trying to make routine measurement of what we're calling well being, but you could call whole person health, but you could call it a lot of different things. We're trying to make this part of sort of just day to day routine workflow. This is one of the things the system does. We have to check your blood pressure, we have to ask you about smoking, uh, we're going to have to do your well-being screen. And so what this does is meant for use in clinical care. It's a validated measure. And uh, we ask the person to consider most important things they're doing in their life or would like to do. Maybe it's their job, managing their health, leisure time, and think back over the last month and rate on a zero to 10 scale. Are you fully satisfied? Are you regularly involved? Are you functioning your best? And the reason this has three different dimensions is just asking if you're satisfied, it doesn't capture um, kind of what's going on underneath. So you really have to go down and find out about functioning and engagement. So, so this question is now in the VA uh, electronic medical record. Uh, it's been piloted in a bunch of medical centers. It's being used on a relatively small scale still right now. Um, but the idea is if we can get this measure into widespread clinical use, it does two things. Number one, it has kind of a forcing function of somebody's going to ask you when you show up for an appointment, at least a couple of times a year, hey, what's important to you in your life right now? And tell us how you're doing like that with that. So it's going to push the conversation in a direction that we're looking for. And then over time, also we're going to be able to see what kind of interventions or approaches help move the needle on this. We have uh, done a couple of small scale studies that show that when you do this well-being sign and then people engage with uh, some of the whole health activities, it does move in the direction we're looking for. So, um, so right now we're kind of poised a uh, big priority for this year is to push out implementation of this on a large scale. But as I said, I think this is something you can do on a small scale. You can do it in your, private practice, you can do it in your clinic practice, you can do it in a, a program like like the UVM program, just as part of routine care, it doesn't take 30 seconds to ask the question. Um, another, I think, important dimension of our work is uh, employee whole health. So uh, the idea that employees, just as much as veterans, deserve to uh, have an opportunity to think about what's important to them, both in their work and in their life, uh, and have the opportunity to access some of these self-care strategies, whether it's yoga, uh, movement, um, tai chi, meditation. Um, this has been a big commitment in VA and of course, really got pumped up by the pandemic because you know everyone was aware of how difficult that was for people and how much we needed to support them as a system. Uh, and so that momentum that started during the pandemic has really continued in VA, which is great. And there's a very vigorous uh, whole health for employees program all around the country now. We do have some data, again, this is observational data, but VA does something called the all employee survey once a year, 
uh, and they measure things like uh, best is this a best place to work, a burnout scale, turnover intent. And we do have some evidence that uh, employees who are more involved with whole health activities at their site have a higher sense of best place to work, lower burnout, lower turnover. So, um, or lower turnover intent is what this measures. So um, we're looking again at this from a lot of different angles to see, you know, can we understand what kind of approaches are most important for employees? So um, this is uh, what John uh, referenced at the beginning. Um, so, you know, giving you a snapshot, hopefully, of what's happening in the VA. Um, we're very interested in the potential for this approach to be shared outside of the system, to be tried in different settings. Um, there are things about the VA that make it easier for us to do it in VA. For example, the fact that we are uh, in some ways a single payer system, although VA does also have a community care uh, network, as you, you guys may know. Um, but the principles of this are potentially also very translatable to uh, other health systems around the country. So this was a 18 month uh, consensus panel that the National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine ran. Uh, and it was uh, meant to look at not just the VA's whole health system, but to look across the country and actually they ended up looking internationally too for different examples of how whole health was being implemented around the world. And then we asked them to look at the evidence, but also look at um, uh, what, what are the facilitators of incorporating these things? What are the challenges? What are the different strategies that different places are doing? They defined five elements. And uh, I think if you look at this, you'll see these are probably really part of what you guys are doing, what John and Kara are doing in the program. And really we need to scale these so that we're doing them everywhere. Um, these are the things that make up the whole health approach is what the National Academy panel was saying. Uh, it has to be people-centered, clearly. It has to pay attention. It, it has to be team-based, but it also has to pay attention to the well-being of the team. It has to be comprehensive and holistic, meaning both comprehensive uh, access to tools and services, but also uh, holistic in terms of looking at whatever disease the person is presenting in the context of the whole person has to be equitable and accountable and take into account health equity and social determinants. And it has to be upstream focused and ideally even involve reaching out beyond the walls of the healthcare system, you know, before people get developed those chronic problems. And what they did, which I think was brilliant, was rather than only look, so when you have a National Academy of Medicine panel, they do a ton of systematic reviews looking at the evidence regarding whatever the question is they're being asked to address. So they looked at the evidence for this entire whole health system approach, like what we're doing in VA, but they actually looked at the published evidence for each of those individual foundational components. And that's where you find tons of research and tons of positive outcomes. So, you know, looking at research on uh, um, healthcare programs that incorporate equity or that specifically focus on team well being. And you see all kinds of things ranging from better patient experience, reduced ED usage, reduced maternal mortality, and, and improved team well-being, et cetera. And so the idea is if, you, um, if these are the benefits that we see even from the individual components, that when we put these together into a system, however we manage to do that, um, we're going to see synergy and additive benefits. Um, these were the conclusions. This top conclusion, I think, is the most powerful. Whole health is a common good that benefits everybody. Um, uh, scaling and spreading is critical, but also difficult and requires a real shift in mindset, right? And so they were honest about the challenge of that. What I will say is uh, they've done briefings, and I've been at quite a number of them for um, a, quite a wide range of folks in government, from the Surgeon General's office to Medicare to HRSA to uh, some congressional committees. And um, there's a lot of interest in what this might mean because there's so much awareness of uh, where we're hitting the wall with our current approach to healthcare. Um, there's interest in this. I wouldn't say that every part of the federal government is ready to take this big step 
and really shift how we're thinking. Um, but there's a very lively conversation and there's a lot of sort of small pilots that are standing up. Medicare is having a really interesting conversation about what would they have to measure as a performance metric or a requirement in order to be able to say that we're actually having a, making an impact in this. So lots of interesting conversations happening as a consequence of this report. So let me shift gears one more time and I just have a couple more slides and then hopefully we'll have a little time for questions. So um, I think it's important when you hear a talk like this, not to be like, okay, well, that's nice but they're doing that in the VA, but it doesn't have anything to do with me. Um, if this resonates with you as a clinician or whatever your role is, there are lots of things you can do. They're not going to magically turn your work on its head or shift the whole health, you know, shift the system that you're in magically to whole health, but they're just going to be steps in the right direction. So uh, what, these are live links that are in here. I don't know if you guys get can get access to the slides somehow, but uh, we do have a whole bunch of courses that are available, which you can see on this site. Um, one thing that's really fabulous is, let me see if I have that slide. Yeah. So during the pandemic, we got asked by uh, VA leadership, you know, a lot of veterans now, we've gotten them connected with Tai Chi and yoga, meditation, and how are you going to make sure they continue to have access during the pandemic? So we rolled out this, it's, it's a... It was a blog. It's now basically a website, but it's a repository of videos, audios, et cetera, uh, that basically are access to all the whole health approaches that I've been talking about. These are three minutes, probably is the shortest. shortest. Some of them are up to 15 or 18 minutes, but there are now, that 141 is uh, out of date. There are over 160 of them now. And they were crowdsourced from VA clinicians. So people were there making recordings in their, in their meeting room of a yoga class or on their phone, or some of them are people managed to get into a studio. But this is an unbelievable resource for you to use with your patients. You could call it up in your exam room. You could say, hey, let me show you this cool site. And if you have something specific in mind for them, you can even tune into the video. Here's a chair yoga class. Here's an acupressure uh, video that teaches you how to do acupressure points on yourself or on a family member. These are there's a whole bunch of these acupressure ones, and these are some of the best ones on there. So you know the idea is, you know, we talk about oh we we know that complementary integrative health, whole health, oh it has benefits, it's good for pain management, good for stress, but oh no it's not covered. We can't really reach out for it. So many of these things are things people can do for themselves that uh, going to this website and, and starting to think of it that way, I think is really, really, really great potential. And I really would urge all of you to take a look at that. So then another thing you can do is just make a little shift in your clinical practice. And some of you may be doing this already, but if not, why not try? And, and you don't even have to do it with everybody in your clinic session. You could pick one or two people to try it with in a day to see what happens. Just ask them what's most important in your life right now. Just you could say, hey, I heard a talk the other day about this thing they're doing in the VA called whole health. And part of what it is, is really having a conversation with people about what's important to them in their life and how they can get there. So thought I would try it out. So tell me what's most important in your life right now. And then if we have a little opportunity to talk about that, what's something you can do today to help you get there? So it could be as simple as... Um, I really, you know, I have a new grandkid. I want to spend time with them, but, you know, I just don't have a lot of energy. I'm tired. I'm not getting around that well because of my back pain. Well, uh, maybe you could just little by little um, start to walk a little more so that it's easier for you to be with them. Maybe it means you want to try uh, going to see an acupuncturist or doing some uh, yoga to help yourself uh, get more mobile so you can be able to handle your grandkids better, whatever it might be. The idea is if you get what's important to them front and center, then any changes or any movement you're looking to help them generate, it's got a motivation attached. So you could do that. And then the last thing you could try is think about adding a well-being measure to routine clinical care. There are many others in addition to the one we have. Um, I personally think what's great about the one we have is that it gives you uh, if you just ask people how satisfied are you in your life right now and you get a 
low answer, you're kind of going to be like, oh, no, what do I do? If you ask them what's most important to your life right now and how are you doing and you get a low answer, then what you can do is next you ask the question, what's getting in the way? What's something we can do to help you get closer to it? It gives you an actionable step. And so I think that that's part of why I really like the one we're using. It's been validated in veterans. It hasn't been used very widely in the general population, but people are starting to use it. So, you know, you can think about adding that into your clinical encounter. Uh, I talked about the Live Whole Health site. If you don't get uh, the PowerPoint and the links, just Google hashtag Live Whole Health and you'll, uh, you'll get to the site. And I really would recommend you do that today. Just take a minute, do it on your phone or, you know, do it in between things, take a look at it. Um, and, and just to conclude, to kind of bring, you know, bring us back full circle to that idea of purpose. Uh, this is from a veteran in St. Louis, a, a woman, I think late thirties. I used to drive over the Mississippi river bridge to Jefferson barracks VA and think about jumping every time. The whole health system has helped me explore my purpose, find ways to use nutrition to reduce my pain and use eye rest and Tai Chi to get moving again. Now I drive over that bridge and I think about tomorrow, I have hope. So the idea is it's not just doing these things for the sake of doing it. Oh, I sent someone to yoga. You know, the idea is where this connects back up to is helping people get closer to what matters to them in their life. And that's ultimately you know, what gives the whole thing a unifying sense of purpose. So um, I think that's all, that is all. So um, I'll stop there and uh, see if people have comments or questions or, or anything, uh, anything else I can share with y'all. Ben, thank you very much. And uh, if you have a question, put it in the chat and I'll look to folks here in the room to see if there are questions. I have one or two. Good. Ben, can you um, maybe focusing on the primary care setting on the um, on the primary care teams, what the impact of um, in the flagship sites has been on the teams anecdotally or any any information you have about that? Yeah, we don't have that, um, you know, employee satisfaction data specifically on primary care teams like we don't have it down to that that uh, that level of breakdown. Um, I think that primary care is both one of the places with the greatest potential and some of the greatest challenge. Um, there's so many, at least in the VA, there's so many clinical reminders. I know it's not just in the VA, but sometimes people feel like they can't even talk to the patient about anything because they're so busy checking off that they did the colonoscopy referral and they screened for, you know, um, a million different things and they checked all the boxes. So I think on one level, um, uh, some primary care folks look at this and say, this is impossible for me as the clinician to be primarily responsible. So I think the places where it's had a really positive impact are places where they've gotten health coaches who are either embedded or in some way connected to uh, primary care. And um, uh, they can kind of help with some of those conversations and they can talk to the veteran about what matters. They can put it in the chart and then it becomes something that primary care doc can can just pick up and use in their in their practice. You know, I will say one other thing that where it has been a great boon. A lot of primary care docs have learned how to do battlefield acupuncture, which is this very quick five needles in each ear acupuncture technique that is used for pain. It's also now really used for stress and a lot of other things. So I think what that has really helped a good number of primary care docs because even though it takes an extra few minutes. So you put the needles in, you have somebody sit for a while, you check on them and you send them home because the needles actually stay in for a few days. But the people tell us a lot that having something they can explicitly do in their session when somebody comes in and tells them they have pain, uh, that that's been a real, a real lift for them, that they really like that. So that's one kind of narrow example of something that I think it's been a real help, but just can't, pretend that primary care isn't having the same pressures in VA that they're having everywhere. And uh, I think I think the solution is really thinking about this as a team undertaking and making sure that they're adequately supported by the right kind of team, which is, you know, the solution to all of the primary care problems, 
um, not just how you how are you going to do whole health, but how are you going to make primary care manageable in this kind of day and age? So, thank you. Uh, another question um, has come up: What do we know, uh, Ben, about the demographics of the folks who jump the the patients who jump um, two feet into the into the whole health uh, system? Yeah, in terms of gender, age. Um, yeah, great question. Race. So, I mean, we definitely see participation across the board. Um, we definitely see um, higher uptake among women veterans. So when you, which is not surprising because when you look in the outside world, women are also much more likely to use complementary integrative health and much more likely to go to the doctor for that matter. But so uh, the proportion of women veterans who are using whole health compared to the proportion of women in the system is much higher than the proportion of men. We've also seen a higher proportion among Black veterans choosing to use whole health um, compared to uh, you know people who are not Black in the system. Um, we're doing a lot of work looking at uh, kind of equity across underrepresented groups and making sure people have access. And so far, we haven't really found anything disturbing about differential access to among different underrepresented groups. But um, in terms of age, it's across the board. Uh, you know, we haven't found, um, I mean, VA skews to an older population, obviously, but uh, people from all ages are interested. Uh, one of the things we really want to explore more is, are there subcategories of people who benefit more from certain kinds of approaches? You know, does a younger veteran who's got, you know, mental health diagnosis and chronic pain, who's able to access an online coaching do they do better because maybe they're busy, they're trying to work, they can't get in to see the coach, you know? So I think there's a lot more to learn about that. So I do Thank see you. some questions in the chat, John. You want me to go yep. for a couple of those? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm running down those. Okay. Um, yeah. We have a question from the planetary health lead, Dr. Pekovic here at UVM about what insights you might have about potential benefits for planetary health, uh, climate change, coming out of this approach? Yeah, um, great question. And honestly, the truth is, I don't think we've done enough uh, to maximize the potential there. Um, so uh, VA, like every government agency, does have certain mandates around, you know, now trying to reduce uh, unnecessary uh, energy utilization, trying to uh, reduce to the degree the government will ever be able to do it, carbon footprint. and. We've had some conversations about how can that connect with whole health as such a natural fit. Um, I don't think we have, you know, I mean, we have, we have planetary health and climate change as part of our education program for clinicians and for veterans, but we don't have a lot of translating it into action steps, you know? Um, and I think that's an area we need to go into more, more vigorously. So thank you for, for pointing that out. But I have a question about um, any challenges the system has experienced getting resources out to clinicians, uh, patients about what's available through whole health. Um, yeah, I mean, we, there are always challenges, of course, particularly because the potential audience is so big, both the employee audience and the, the, the veteran audience. Um, so there's still lots and lots and lots of veterans that don't know about this there are still i regularly meet veterans who who hear about this and they're excited and they tell me well i go to the va in jackson mississippi or i go to the va in you know in houston and nobody's told me about this and they're telling me about a va where it is actually happening but the their primary care teams maybe they don't know about it yet or maybe they're in an outpatient site that's not so fully connected to the to the main medical center so um it's a big, uh, uh, it's, it's an ongoing big effort that we have. And we just basically use every single channel that's available to us. We've done uh, advertising campaigns. There's, there's very large distribution uh, newsletters that go out to the veteran population. And we regularly have stories in there about veterans engaging with whole health. Um, you know, we do our best to kind of uh, be really visible in the VA social media and the YouTube channel, et cetera. Um, it's, we're always working on that one, I would say. I mean, I really think, to be honest, and we've, we've had some conversations, uh, you know, VA gets a lot of bad press, as I'm sure you guys are aware, just 
whenever anything bad happens in VA, somebody from Congress jumps on it, the press jumps on it. It's really easy to kind of, it's a really easy target. Um, and I don't think personally VA does quite a good enough job uh, marketing its good news and its good news stories. And uh, so we've been just working and talking a lot about how uh, wouldn't it be possible to actually advertise this public service campaign? I mean, if you if you look at what the armed services do for recruiting, you know, look at those army ads or be the best you can be, you know, clearly they know what they're doing. Um, and I wish we could get VA to, to do something similar because I think it would bring in a lot of veterans who maybe are looking at the VA and saying, oh, I don't know if that's for me. Um, but it's hard. It's There's a culture of, a little bit of a culture of, uh, we just wait until something bad happens and then we defend ourselves as opposed to we're out there telling people what's what's kind of amazing and uh, unusual about the VA. So, um, I, I, yeah, I think I a lot of work you, there. Yeah. I wonder if the Army would notice if you just adopted that, be the best you can be. Yeah. Great um, idea. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, just a comment about health coaches, which you have um, pointed out being really important to the effort, Ben, and do they reside within the health teams or are they an external referral or what does that look yeah, like? Yeah, um, it's really variable in different places. So um, for example, uh, Vision 8, which is the Florida region, a couple of years ago decided to hire 200 health coaches across the whole system. And every, every health coach has three primary care teams that they're responsible for supporting. And so they're kind of right there, even right there physically a lot of the time. Uh, the pain uh, program nationally has funded uh, 30 VAs to hire a health coach onto their pain management team so that they're inside the team. Um, and other places haven't done it that way. They're doing it by external referral or some places, you know, smaller VAs that can't necessarily hire everybody uh, sometimes are doing it by telehealth to another VA, you know, that's sharing the services. Um, so we're, we kind of have to do it every which way that we can. I mean, I think our gut feeling is it's going to be better if they're integrated into the team. Um, but I think the reality of limited resources also says we have to keep exploring other ways to do it too. Um, the the telecoaching, there is a couple of some really interesting qualitative so far studies of telehealth, tele whole health coaching, uh, finding really, really high uh, uh, acceptability for veterans. And in fact, some veterans prefer it you're sitting in your living room talking to your coach. You don't have to drive and find a parking space. You feel comfortable. You feel comfortable with the privacy that nobody's overhearing you. Um, so, but then we hear other people saying it's important to me to see them in person. So, but but we've been really surprised by how much uptake and how much positive feedback we've gotten from uh, veterans about um, remote coaching in particular. Other services obviously are less easily adapted, but. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And just we just have a minute or two left, but um, just wanted to get to this question. Excellent presentation. Very important questions. Helping a person get closer to what matters in their life. Does the whole health approach extend to what matters at the end of life or after serious illness? Yes. Um, is there an end of life component? Yeah, great, great question. And, and that's when I can give you a definite yes. So VA has a Social work has a very large uh, advanced care planning initiative, and actually mostly it uses group settings, which is really interesting. And so we've done tons of kind of training and back and forth with them about how to incorporate whole health principles into that. Um, also, the VA is engaged with this initiative called the Age-Friendly Health System Initiative, which you're probably aware of, which is an Institute for Healthcare Improvement designation that you can get. Uh, and it's based on the four M's. Uh, what matters is one of them. And then uh, uh, mentation, morbid, uh, mentation, medication, and mobility. So to be a, a designated an age-friendly health system, you have to identify those four things. And obviously what matters is front and center. So right away, you have to have a goals of care situation if you want to get there. And there's a lot of momentum and pressure from geriatrics nationally for, you know, local VAs and local, uh, you know, kind of the nursing home version in the VA to uh, move forward so they can get that designation. So I think we're doing pretty well with that one. You know, I would say not everybody, right. but but we, we have 
we have avenues that really are getting more and more open to make that uh, a natural integration, I would say. Thank you. I think, um, thank you very much, Ben. I think we are at time. Um, ben, thanks so much for an excellent uh, presentation, really um, stimulating and thought provoking. And thank you for your work on uh, creating a new way to approach care that hopefully will uh, help us do much better in terms of both health of the clinician team, uh, health team, but especially health of patients. So thank you very much for all of your work. Well, thank you. And, and I, I want to thank you guys again for what you're doing in Vermont, because I think in some ways, building the models that translate some of this into uh, the, the, the big old private or, you know, uh, non-governmental healthcare sector is some of the heaviest lift and you guys are doing a great job with that. So thank you. Thank you. Take good care. Thank you all.